Um, I'm a movement disorders neurologist. I see patients every day, and, and I practice what you've just heard. I prescribe medications. I refer for surgery. Um, but I also listen to patients who tell me all sorts of different things that have worked for them or that they've read about or they have questions about. And I'm really interested in kind of looking at these individualized approaches that people have found to treatments that go beyond what we know in conventional medicine. So most of what I'm going to talk about today we don't learn about in medical school. Um, and the reason for that is that we don't have a lot of data behind it. What you've heard up until now is uh, what we have from a wealth of research that's been done in the field. Um, looking at the effects of different medications, looking at the effects of surgeries, um, using high quality studies that really help us understand what works based on reducing as much bias as we can in our studies, um, based on using high, vol high numbers of patients to get a good understanding of what works and what doesn't. And the reason that um, these non-conventional medications, are, uh, treatments are non-conventional is that they don't, they, they lack that. They, either because they haven't been studied or because there's no funding for these studies or, or lack of interest among the people that should be studying it. Um, and so I, I call these complementary and integrative treatments. Um, the term that you may hear here also is complementary and alternative or CAM. Um, I prefer to call them integrative because that's how I use them. Uh, I don't think these should be considered as alternatives to the treatments that we know about. I think that um, what I'm advocating for is an integrative approach, meaning a combined approach using some of these methods. Um, but I'm going to give a, a, some disclosures here about what I'm talking about in a second. So for the first half of the talk, I'm going to actually just talk about the concept of complementary and integrative medicine and why that might be an important concept in dystonia. Um, and then I'll, I'll kind of run through some of the evidence. And it's impossible to cover all of the different modalities, herbs, treatments, uh, interventions that people read about and, and can consider doing in one talk. Um, and every time I do a review of this topic, people will ask about questions, things that I've maybe even never heard of. Um, so what I've focused on are the things that I hear the most about that I feel patients are using the most or where there is the mo biggest wealth of information in the literature. Um, so I don't have any relevant disclosures here. Uh, the one thing I wanted to say is that most of the studies that I'm going to talk about were conducted in adults and in adults with idiopathic focal dystonias. And so you've heard about the different kinds of dystonias. And so we, we, use, we, we try and, and use this information and, and assume that s similar findings will be the case in people with generalized or genetic dystonias. But most of the studies were done in the populations that are more available. And that's the idiopathic vocal dystonias, which are much more frequent and much more common. Um, and so there are, again, different kinds of dystonias. And so you can see that um, there are, is my laser? Yeah, it's showing up. So there are focal cervical dystonias, so dystonias of the neck. There are people who have generalized dystonias that can affect the limb and, and then progress to the rest of their body. There are people with task-specific dystonias who may, may feel normal except for when they go and grab an instrument and try and play their instrument, then their hand may cramp up or curl up in a certain way. Um, so there's all sorts of different for forms of dystonias, task-specific, focal, generalized. And the conventional approach to these is to focus on the symptom of the dystonia. So there are uncontrollable muscle contractions that result in this distorted, twisted motions. And so the major complaints that people have with that are uncontrolled movements, pain, stiffness. And those are the, those are the symptoms that are addressed with the medications and with the surgical procedures. And so this is sort of a basic diagram of kind of the options. It's drugs, which you've already heard about. It's chemodenervation with botulinum toxin, surgical therapies, and then this group of other therapies, which I'm going to be focusing on, includes physical and occupational therapy, and that's considered conventional. Um, but then there's also these unconventional treatments. So why even look at these? So there, are, there obviously have to be some limitations of conventional treatments, or we wouldn't even be considering alternative treatments. Um, and so some people don't get a good response to, to medications or to surgery. Some people um, have an inadequate response. For some people, the medications and the surgeries are great, and they don't really need anything else. But there are lots of people who find a need for something else. Sometimes responses to medications or to toxins are short-lasting. Sometimes side effects limit treatment. Um, I think a big factor is that we have to remember that for many people, dystonia is not just 
the physical symptoms that we see. But there's a whole host of non-motor issues that are related to dystonia. We find very high rates of anxiety, depression, these mood-related symptoms that can present much years before the, dysto the dystonia presents in patients as well. It can be a result, but it can also present before, which makes it seem like it's actually part of the disease process itself for many people. Uh, and for some people, and for, many, for most people, uh, the treatments that we use are not curative, they're symptomatic. So the point here is that we have to treat people as individuals. We can't treat a disease because everybody's response is going to be different and everybody's going to need something different. Um, and, and that's where these kind of integrative approaches come in. So the actual definition of complementary and alternative medicine is very disappointing to me. And it's, it's a terrible definition. It's, this is the Harvard Medical School definition. So it's all the practices that we don't learn about in medical school that are used for health purposes. That's the definition. So some examples uh, that you've heard of probably. Manual therapies, so chiropractic or massage therapies. Mind-body focused interventions, so things like meditation or yoga or relaxation based interventions. Biofeedback, um, probably some people have heard about this, maybe not as common as some of the others I just discussed, but this is using operant conditioning, which essentially people are hooked up to devices that can actually measure or show different muscle contractions, and, and they can actually see the way their muscles are, are working physiologically, and then try and tr learn behaviors to reduce that activity by watching the monitor and seeing how that muscle responds, and eventually those become habits that uh, ideally will reduce those, those movements. Chinese medicine and acupuncture. Um, there's art, humor, and expressive therapies. And then there's more sort of controversial therapies like homeopathy, cannabis, and some energy uh, therapies. So the way they're actually grouped down uh, by the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine is they're classified into natural products, mind-body practices, and alternative systems. And where I'm going to focus the most attention is where most of the, the small body of literature is, which is in the mind-body practices. And, and these are probably the ones that are the most commonly used, with the exception of vitamins. These are probably the biggest category. And again, I'm not going to cover everything. Um, and when I did my search, it's, you know, it's quite extensive. What I tried to do is avoid as much as possible where I found data that was a case report of one person reporting benefits and tried to find that data that's the higher level data, the data where it's groups of people, higher numbers, and where ideally there's some way of controlling for the intervention and controlling for bias and placebo effects. But that's hard to do, actually, you'll see um, in, this, in this literature. So what drives all, what's the theme that drives all these interventions together? So first is an idea of wellness. That uh, Part of this is the goal of preventing disease by staying healthy. But even once a person has disease, that the importance of just overall health um, through exercise, eating healthy, being just overall wellness can have an impact on the disease itself. And this is certainly true for diseases that aren't purely genetic, diseases that have a combination of what we call genetics and environment, um, where we don't have one exact thing that causes the disease, which is true probably for a lot of the focal idiopathic dystonias. But even for gen the genetic dystonias, where we do have a specific cause, and we can say it's because of this gene mutation that someone has the disease, we still find that two people with DYT1 experience the disease very differently. And so it has to be more than just the genetics that impact how that disease affects the person. Um, and so this idea of just overall wellness, I think, is important. Next is the idea of self-healing. And a lot of the focus on, in, in complementary interventions is on the idea that it's not as important why the cells in the, in the brain are sick, but how can we get them to repair or stay healthy? Um, and then sort of a focus on, on using our body's inner resources to keep our body healthy. Um, there's the idea of energy that comes throughout this, uh, the idea that disruptions in the balance and flow of energy cause illness, and that if we can rebalance that our, these energy systems, then, then uh, that leads be to better health. Um, the idea of the importance of plants comes up frequently, so we know that plants produce oxygen, they're a source of nutrients, and they are a source of medicines that we know of, and so using plants and their en the energy from plants can be important. And then lastly, as I mentioned already, the idea of individuality. So most contemporary medicine is disease-focused. We, we have a diagnosis, and we treat that diagnosis. But with 
many of these complementary interventions, the idea is individual. It's that we can't neglect that natural variation that exists from person to person, and different people have different needs. So focusing on dystonia now, who's using complementary and, in and integrative or alternative medicines? So if we look at a US survey of adults with focal dystonia, about 53% were using at least one form of the different interventions that I'm going to talk about to treat their symptoms. And this was just pre pretty recently, a few years ago. Um, and that's compared to about a third of adults without dystonia. So it's, it's higher than in the general population or people with, with other diseases. Um, and many of them were using it along, as I said, as an integrative approach, along with conventional treatments like botulinum toxin injections. And this has really been growing rapidly. Um, you know, if you looked at 2000, you see how much money was spent on these different interventions. About $14 billion per year was spent in the US in 2000, and it's about 2007, I found that it was about $40 billion just out of pocket spent, spent on these interventions. So you can see the growth in the popularity of these interventions. And that growth has happened despite not having good evidence. And so this is all based on anecdotes, people telling each other that this might work, people trying things because they're desperate um, and want other things that will help them. Um, and this is just a graph of those out-of-pocket expenses. In green, this, this is all the out-of-pocket expenses that were the spending that was happening in 2007. And you can see this uh, wedge here, which is almost a quarter of that spending was on complementary and alternative medicines. So why? Why are people doing this? So one may be philo just philosophy. Some people may feel just a desire for a holistic approach to their treatment. Um, for some people, it's cultural. If you're talking about things like Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic medicine, this may be a cultural thing. Um, I think a big important point is this idea of empowerment, this idea for a desire for control over the illness. I think there's probably, mentally, it's probably hard to go to a doctor tell him a problem, receive a medication, take that medication and hope you get better. And it's sort of a passive uh, feeling. But when you're actually doing something where you're engaged and in, in doing some sort of intervention, uh, whether it's a mind-body intervention, a relaxation-based intervention, I think it's empowering. I think it kind of gives you a little bit of the power in terms of how to help yourself uh, in terms of getting healthy and getting well. Um, for some people, it's just dissatisfaction with conventional healthcare. Again, they've tried them, they felt like they had too many side effects, they are too invasive, and, they're, and that, that may be a reason for, for sort of trying to bring in other modalities. Sometimes it's media attention. I mean, you get, you get press over a certain technique, some, someone says that this helped them, and it gets into the press, and people want to try it for that reason. And that's not necessarily because of any evidence. Um, so that's something to watch out for, especially when people say, I read on the internet such and such was the cure for this disease. And I'm always very cautious because I've done those literature search and I've seen, I've never heard of this. And I've, uh, where, where was this in any of the, the data? Uh, and there, it's often because it's more anecdote, people describing things but not actually having them studied. Additional factors that predict use of complementary medicine is simply being, for some reason, being female, uh, being younger, having a higher level of education and a poor health status. And I think that last one is probably the idea of leaving nothing undone, that you've tried lots of things and health is still poor, and so people probably turn to these alternative treatments. Um, this was uh, specifically looking at people with dystonia and saying what was motivating them to use or not use these treatments. And probably the most common was, so it can happen before or after the diagnosis, it looks like, about 49, about 38% of these people surveyed said the dystonia diagnosis hadn't been made yet, and so it was probably symptoms that were bothering them. There was no clear diagnosis, and they were going to all sorts of different practitioners to help, and that led to their use of these other interventions. But for some people, you can see 32%, it was conventional treatment was unsuccessful, and so they were looking for all other options. Among people who weren't using it, the most common reason to not use it was just lack of information about it. They didn't know enough about it. Why do some, a lot of physicians discourage patients from using complementary treatments? Um, so the, probably the biggest issue here is just lack of scientific evidence. And that will become apparent through my talk, unfortunately. Um, most of these therapies have not been well studied in well-designed trials. Um, the, the idea of the power not being high enough, essentially that there, a lot of these studies are very small, five-person studies, six-person studies. These aren't large enough to give us a good sense of whether we're looking at random effects or actual effects of, of interventions. Uh, this concern of or these internet testimonials that I've talked to you about, that that's not really science, is a big concern for a lot of physicians. 
For some, it's just discomfort over their level of knowledge. We don't learn about these interventions in medical school, and we don't know enough about them or how they work or why they would work. And so that's, that's a, a major reason for a lot of physicians. And then there's concern over potentially risky results of these treatments. So not everything that's natural or holistic is safe. And that's another reason they need to be studied. We know that there are herbal medications that do have toxic effects or drug interactions. And so just because something is herbal or natural doesn't necessarily mean it's safe. Um, things like even chiropractic manipulations have occasionally been associated with uh, tears in blood vessels from neck manipulations and, th and things like that. So there's reasons that sometimes physicians are cautious when they don't know a lot about these interventions. Um, hopefully it's not because of control issues or ego issues. If that's a reason, it's probably a reason to find another doctor. Um, and then, you know, legal concerns, probably not as common, but uh, probably a doctor doesn't want to recommend something that they don't know enough about just in case there are adverse effects. Um, but these are, this is important because these are reasons that patients often hide these, the use of these treatments from their physicians. And when we look at it, we find that most patients don't tell their physicians that they're using these other interventions because they're worried about how the physician will react or discourage them from using it. And that leads to bad issues with safety and poor rapport between the patient and the physician. So hopefully physicians will become more open to discussing these things at least. Um, so I talked about evidence a lot. And so what you're going to see as I go into this is, you know, ideally what we want to see for studies are these higher level parts of the pyramid, these randomized control trials. And, and the reason for that is that they control for bias um, and they have, uh, can give us a sense of cause and effect. So without controlling studies um, for the intervention that you're doing, it's hard to conclude whether a certain cause and effect relationship is or whether the cause preceded the effect or not. Um, and so that's why we really are looking for these higher level studies and they're, they're very much lacking in this field. Um, in the conventional treatments that we use with the botulinum toxins and the surgical procedures, we have a lot of these trials. Um, so lastly, I want to just kind of talk about more uh, why dystonia specifically might benefit from this. So um, first of all, kind of to back up, while we don't have a lot of evidence, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's no benefit. It just means that the benefits haven't been studied. So one thing that doctors sometimes need to realize is that absence of evidence doesn't mean absence of benefit. It just means that something needs to be studied. Um, not understanding how or why something works definitely doesn't mean that it doesn't work. And that's another block that a lot of times we have in medicine is for a lot of these interventions, we don't know why they would work. Um, most patients are actually trying safe and relatively low-cost therapies, so that's something that we do need to realize in our discussions. Um, and the biggest thing is I think we, we sometimes underestimate the importance of this empowerment, reducing stress, and just overall healthy lifestyle and how that affects the disease itself. So this is an intentionally complicated diagram like the ones you saw before. And the reason for that is to show you that we don't fully understand the mechanism of dystonia. And so to say that there are interventions and we don't understand how they work, I think that that's okay when we don't fully understand the mechanism of dystonia to begin with. Um, you know, for some, for some, this shows you, this highlights some of the genes that we know can be mutated and, and cause some of the genetic forms of dystonia and how they affect the dopamine production pathway. And this shows you some pathways in that part of the brain in the basal ganglia that can, can go awry um, as a result of the dystonia that leads to some of the excessive movements. And there's a lot of connections in the brain that are involved with dystonia. So that's relevant to some of these CAM practices because there's, first of all, this idea of neuroplasticity. A lot of, of, of science is, is pointing towards the fact that the brain is, remains plastic even into older age, meaning connect, new connections um, can be formed throughout, uh, not only in people who have dystonia, but throughout age and even in Alzheimer's patients, it, very elderly Alzheimer's patients, they've shown um, the ability to form new connections um, over time. So there's this idea of plasticity of the connections that are going haywire in dystonia, and maybe we can redirect those. Um, the idea of the combination of genetics and environment I've already stressed in terms of healthy lifestyle. And then the mind-body connection is another one, uh, why, why dystonia might be specifically, um, why these techniques may be specifically useful in dystonia is because of that mind-body connection affecting both the motor and the non-motor aspects of the disease together. Um, so, you know, uh, this sort of highlights a little bit of that again. So the successful treatment of a chronic disease does, does require a lot of adaptive skills, um, adapting to pain relief, adapting to stress relief, and those are things we're not good at treating with conventional medications. 
Um, and dystonia in particular has a high sensitivity to these psychological stressors or sens sensory stressors that make the symptoms worse. And so in one study, 91% of people with dystonia met criteria for some other psychiatric illness like depression, panic disorder, anxiety. Um, and so these are things that need to be treated just like the movement symptoms need to be treated. So this is just a summary of the experience that patients have had with specific modalities. So acupuncture in this study was the most common among people with dystonia. And you can see that in terms of who felt it was a positive experience versus a negative experience, it was definitely not, not a positive experience in maybe 20% of people in that group. You can see the next most common was, I think, relaxation therapies, where it was about 50-50 in terms of who felt it was beneficial or not. Um, hypnosis was down here. Uh, you know, 15% felt it was a positive experience. These are anecdotes. These are just patients reporting their, whether they felt it was beneficial or not. So it's not exactly science, but, but at least it gives us a sense of what people are experiencing and feel like is helpful. This is a similar, a different study looking again in the black bar is how effective they felt it was. In the gray bar is how much it was being used. So exercise was not being used a lot, but it was thought very effective for, for people. Um, things like massage therapy, also people were reporting it as pretty effective. Chiropracty, biofeedback, acupuncture. So again, we're going to look at this and we're going to think about kind of the hierarchy of evidence as I go through some of these. And you'll see that unfortunately most of them are down here in terms of the studies, which is why we can't make firm conclusions. But I still think it's useful to look at this as a sign of maybe some of these are worth studying more and worth considering, particularly if we have some idea that they're safe. So sensory tricks were mentioned. And sensory tricks are important. I've seen several sensory tricks here in the audience. And this is sort of this idea that um, uh, so, sort of in, in the most common one is patients with cervical dystonia who have uh, their neck is sort of twisted in a certain way. Touching the chin gently can bring their neck back into position. Why does something like that work? We don't really know. Um, the brain kind of maps certain body parts in certain ways, and it may be that simple touch uses a different pathway of the brain and, and kind of allows that to relax. Um, can the, so this kind of brings up the idea of whether we can rebalance these networks in the brain. Can we do things to sort of change the structures and the mapping of the way things are in the brain? Um, this is a, hard to read from where you guys are. This is a list of all different sensory tricks that people have reported that have worked for them, from touching the chin to wearing certain kinds of glasses to all sorts of different things that have worked for different focal dystonias. And so sensory training, I think, is an interesting um, thing to study. So... First, people looked at monkeys, and in this one study, they took monkeys and they had them for months grip a hand grip over and over again. They had them gripping a hand grip, and they developed dystonia in that hand. And when they looked at the mapping for their hand on, in the brain of that monkey, they found that what areas that used to be ma mapped more for, for individual fingers, it looked like it was uh, mapping of the entire hand more. So the, the mapping of individual fingers became less pronounced, and it was a greater area that was being mapped for the hand. So they looked at, uh, they, they, they kind of used that as an idea to try to look at how that they could use that in humans, this kind of restructuring of brain areas and brain networks. So they took 10 people with focal hand dystonia, writer's cramp dystonia. This is how this uh, one patient was writing at baseline. He was left-handed and he was writing, this is how he wrote with his left hand and how he wrote with his right hand. And um, they taught them to read Braille for eight weeks with that, with that dominant hand. And after that, he was able to kind of write normally, and actually with both hands, was able to write much more normally. Um, and so the, the, th the thought here was, again, perhaps there was a restructuring, a remapping of brain networks that was occurring um, as a result of that practice of learning to use the fine fingers. And, and maybe that mapping of the fingers was kind of overtaking the mapping of the hand, sort of in the reverse of what was happening with the monkey. So I think this is something that there aren't a lot of studies on, but something that I think is definitely interesting um, and, and worth studying in the future to try and treat some of these diseases. Um, acupuncture. So why might acupuncture work? So this, a lot of this is based on the idea of energy balances and flow of energy, which is really not part of what we uh, understand in Western medicine. Um, in Western medicine, we kind of think about acupuncture more as stimulating nerve receptors and leading to hormonal changes or changes in blood flow as a result of those, of those stimuli. 
So they actually looked at lots of, there have been lots of studies looking at blood flow in the map and brain, in, in mapping of the brain and looking at what areas are more active or less active as a, real, as a result of acupuncture. And acupuncture has been shown to change patterns of blood flow, and particularly in areas that control uh, pain signaling. Um, so as a result of, of stimulating with acupuncture in certain areas, you can actually see the brain changes in certain areas that are related to pain signaling. Um, and they've done some studies looking at improvement in pain and range of motion in the neck um, in several larger case reports of people, particularly with cervical dystonia, who are getting acupuncture and finding that their range of motion improves and their pain improves. Um, but these are, these are, while these are case reports, so that puts them on the kind of a lower level of evidence, they were, some of them were larger case reports. Um, and the side effects were pretty rare. I mean, less than 10% of people that reported minor bleeding or needle pain. Um, the one thing I would say with the acupuncture is definitely, if someone is considering using it, is finding a certified person from the, the NCAM Association of Oriental Medicine if you're going to use that. But the official recommendation is that there are no adequate reviews or randomized control trials or, or high quality clinical trials that can actually make us recommend acupuncture for people with focal or generalized dystonia at this point. But those case reports are, are, I think, very interesting and important. Um, I think that they raise some level of suspicion that they might be beneficial, but we need to study it more. And, ho and we're actually working on this at Northwestern and hopefully getting a, a, um, a study going on this uh, in the future. Um, this is a sort of a difficult concept, and, and what some people think that part of the pathophysiology of dystonia is that normally we're inhibiting signals for our muscles to contract. And there's a loss of this inhibition of the muscle contraction in some people with dystonia, maybe due to some other external stimuli. And this sort of leads to some of the theories behind hypnosis. And so, oh. so in hypnosis, hypnosis is this state of intense inward focus, um, which is sort of thought to be incompatible with any external stimuli affecting you. And so it might be that that results in more of that normal inhibition that, that we're supposed to have over our muscles. Um, and it's possible that this, that this is a technique that may also alleviate some of the other non-motor symptoms like anxiety and depression. So is there evidence for this? Well, again, not a lot. Um, so there are um, two studies that I found that reported about seven cases with improved pain from hypnotherapy um, and improved um, neck position, but the neck position was described as being improved only during the sessions. Um, and so that's something that also is a limitation of a lot of these studies is a lot of times we'll see improvements with acupuncture, with the massage studies, and even with the chiropractic studies during sessions, but we don't know anything about duration of benefits. And so it's possible that a week later or a month later, um, these benefits may wear off, but these studies often aren't carried out that far, which is a limitation. Biofeedback. So I mentioned this a little bit. Hooking yourself up to an apparatus that can sort of read the way the physiology of your muscles looks and um, looking at the waves of the way the muscles uh, are, are activated, kind of training yourself to be able to reduce that activation in certain ways um, and uh, becoming making it more of a habit, a learned habit over time. So uh, there is some evidence for this, and a lot of it was in the 70s and 80s, where there were lots of actually case reports, again, reporting benefits. Um, in 1991, there was actually a controlled trial um, where they took 12 patients with dystonia um, who got uh, biofeedback, and they compared them to people who just did general relaxation techniques. And they found in the biofeedback group that neck muscle activity was improved more than in the other group. Um, they found that both groups improved in the range of motion of the neck and in their mood. And after 15 sessions, they found the benefits kind of were maintained three months later. So they did actually do some, some follow-up to see if benefits were maintained. The, the only thing I'll say about this, other than the fact that it's a small study, only 12 patients, is there was a lot of inter-individual variability. So while it was a significant difference, um, some people had no effect and others had a large effect. And so this goes again towards that idea of individuality. And some people benefit from certain things that others don't. So, you know, the, the aim of biofeedback is to sort of reestablish those normal postures and patterns of muscle activity. Um, and while it seems a reasonable approach, um, it definitely needs to be tested with bigger uh, randomized control trials. And again, this is something where we don't think there's much in the way of side effects to worry about um, that have ever been reported with this. Chiropractic. So these are manual techniques that involve joint adjustment and different manipulations that affect the spine and the musculoskeletal system. 
Um, and a few case reports have again showed some positive results, mostly in people with cervical dystonia, dystonia of the neck. This is not a person, uh, but it, it's the, one of the main uh, case reports you'll find if you actually do a search. I think it's one of the most interesting because he has such a long neck. Um, and you can see that he does have, this giraffe does have dystonia in the neck. And they used massage therapy techniques and chiropractic techniques and actually improved the, in this one case uh, of a giraffe, um, improved their dystonia. So I thought that was interesting. So, but we found no actual strong randomized controlled trials or clinical trials to actually make a firm recommendation about chiropractic for cervical dystonia or any other kind of dystonia. So behavioral interventions. So these are things like relaxation practices, cognitive behavioral therapies, habit reversal therapies. There were um, nine papers, only two of which were actually randomized controlled trials, so that highest level of evidence in terms of trials. All of them showed improvement in severity of the dystonia, in emotional distress, but again, these, a lot, most of the studies were of poor quality. So the conclusion again ends up being that there's limited evidence um, for these, but, but definitely these are modalities that should be considered. And when you think about exercise in particular, um, as a combination with some of these, I think is where we see probably the most benefit. So neck exercise in cervical dystonia patients, um, they did a study of 20 patients that were randomized to neck exercise or just relaxation for three months. Um, and they saw a trend towards improvement in the exercise group over the relaxation group. It wasn't technically significant if you look at the statistical analysis, but it was a trend towards benefit. Um, you know, several other studies have looked at different modalities from strengthening, stretching, biofeedback, um, TENS units, different kinds of therapies have been looked at. Um, this is probably the one that I think is the most interesting. Uh, actually, so I think it argues for an integrative approach to these therapies. They took 40 patients with cervical dystonia, randomized them to just getting bo uh, botulinum toxin alone or botulinum toxin with a rehabilitation program. And they found that th that program, which was two weeks of massage, stretching, balance, strengthening, and biofeedback, um, that, that combination of treatments along with the botulinum toxin was more beneficial. They had longer duration of benefits between injections of the botulinum toxin. They actually needed lower doses of toxin to see the same benefits. Um, they had reduced ratings of their disability and uh, lower scores on, in terms of pain scores. So the only herbal treatment that I'm gonna talk about is cannabis because this is probably the most common question we get, especially lately in the last year or so in Illinois. Um, and so this is just a poll from the New England Journal of Medicine looking at cannabis in general and what do doctors think. And it's interesting that most doctors all over the world actually think that cannabis does have medicinal benefits. Um, that uh, this was a poll of just whether the, we think that the federal regulations are sort of outdated um, and whether doctors should be prosecuted for prescribing. And, and most people in this vote did not think so. So kind of nationally, people think that cannabis should, should have a purpose or a use in medicine. Even the Dalai Lama recommends it. <laughs> so Illinois became the 20th state to legalize medicinal marijuana two years ago now. So it's a four-year pilot program that Illinois is in. And it's for specific conditions, of which dystonia is one. And uh, it includes some protections against discrimination for jobs and landlords and things like that. It includes a certain amount that can be obtained. Um, and there are certain cultivation centers that can grow it and certain dispensaries that can dispense it. And you can see dystonia here is one of the quote unquote debilitating medical conditions that qualifies in Illinois. So why would we even consider dystonia in this population? So cannabis receptors are widely distributed in the brain. This, uh, in the deep part, this is a rat brain, but I, I think that this is the basal ganglia in the rat right here. Um, and in this deep part of the brain, which is the area that's affected most in dystonia, um, there are a lot of cannabis receptors. Where you see orange is where there's the highest density of cannabis receptors. So there's actually a ton there. Um, and it actually has some inhibitory effects on those excessive pathways uh, that, that lead to movement and lead to muscle contractions. Um, and so that leads to some interest in whether this might actually be able to, to reduce the we, uh, spasticity that people can get and, and the dystonic uh, posturing that people have. But it also, because of, you see there's orange elsewhere in the brain, it leads to concerns about potential side effects and other effects because it's not, it's, it has no way of targeting specifically this deep part of the brain. 
These are all the different kinds of effects that have been described from cannabis that we, our bodies actually naturally make um, for these receptors. So these receptors don't exist for, for marijuana. They exist for endogenous cannabinoids that we all make. And these are the effects of those. So they have effects on appetite and muscle control and pain and immune function and other things. But the adverse effects is where we kind of lack a lot of knowledge. You know, there's been a lot of research on, you know, can driving be impaired? Certainly it could be impaired. Um, can respiratory effects be a result of, of smoking um, marijuana? And while there has been evidence of some chronic inflammatory changes in long-term users, the, the debate still exists about whether it can actually be carcinogenic and cause lung cancers. We, we don't know. Um, and then psychiatric effects. Um, in terms of effects on anxiety and panic, those have been well described. But what about things like motivation, cognition, weight? These are things we know less about. When it comes to memory, we're actually learning more. Uh, we always thought that actually cannabis probably had short-term effects on memory and thinking. But this is a study that's actually showing some long-term effects from chronic users, even after they stopped using. So that, that this raised some questions and concerns uh, about um, decision-making and risk-taking, even like long-term after use. Dosing is a complex issue here. So, it's difficult to standardize. We don't know what people are getting when they're getting it from the dispensaries. There are different strains. Different strains have different kinds of functions. Some can be more uppers. Some are sort of more downers. Um, the dosing isn't clear. How do you tell someone how much to take and how much is effective for different people? Um, and the levels of concentrations of the different ingredients in the cannabis, the active ingredients of the THC and the cannabidiol differ from strain to strain as well. So that's kind of difficult when it comes to prescribing it or recommending it. So according to a, the American Academy of Neurology recent guidelines, there is insufficient data to support or refute the efficacy of oral cannabinoids, which is interesting since it's approved in Illinois. So it's really bypassed the, the level of evidence that you need to really make a clear recommendation the way a drug gets approved and has to go through all these loops to finally get approved. Sort of just jumped through that, said, forget the data. Illinois says it's OK. Um, the studies are really small and, in, and have inconsistent results. This is the summary of the studies. So case studies, again, those are the weakest level of evidence. One person, five people. So self-reported improvement in dystonia after one joint. Um, here, uh, this patient, these five patients used oral cannab, uh, basically a pill form of it. Um, and it exacerbated some of their tremor that they had. Um, and then you can see another one person here reported significantly improved dystonia. When you look at the, ra the higher level studies, the randomized control studies, this one had 15 and this one had seven, you saw no significant reduction in dystonia here, no improvement in dystonia here. So that's the level of, that's all of the, really the evidence that we have. And so um, when you look at doctors and what they, how they make their decisions about whether to recommend it or not when a patient asks about it, and they do ask about it a lot, um, this is where we get our, our, this is where we make our decisions. If you ask movement disorder specialists from around the world, this was asked about Parkinson's disease, not about dystonia. But if you ask them about Parkinson's, how they make their decision about whether to recommend cannabis or not, where are they getting their information? Well, the medical literature is part of it, but there's not a lot there. And so you can see that physicians are basing their opinion on personal experience, the media and the news, uh, personal opinion, um, you know, a few from lectures and courses, but most haven't learned about it actually, again, in medical school. And so you see where, they, they, where the decisions are coming from, and that's a little worrisome. So my, my feeling about cannabis, palliative uses are probably legitimate um, for appetite, for pain, in people who are at end of life, who are having issues like that, I think it has legitimate purposes. Um, it's been studied quite a bit more for pain and for appetite than it has been for specific things like dystonia. Non-palliative uses, so in circumstances um, you know, where um, it may be less harmful than some conventional medications, we, we need to consider it and study it more. Certainly if people are using, let's say, a lot of narcotic pain medications to treat their pain, could this be safer than narcotic medications? Maybe, probably, but you know, so these are places where we need to consider it. Um, but again, we need to actually prove benefits. Um, so I think the jury is still out on whether it works, and about safety and dosing, we're still a little bit lost. For recreational use, which it has been approved in Colorado and maybe Washington, um, probably not justifiable at this point, based on the, especially the safety data, which we don't really understand as much. So these are just my overall conclusions from, from this talk. So these alternative and uh, complementary integrative modalities, they may have a role in dystonia, 
but the good studies are lacking. So they, uh, good studies that would actually minimize bias and prove that cause-effect relationship are really lacking. So we can't actually make any clear recommendations about the use of any of these specific modalities. Um, but given the, you know, the amount of money that is being spent on these, we really need to fund more research um, and train physicians about these different modalities that at least we have some evidence that some of them have worked for people. We really need to know more about them. The cost, unfortunately, is mostly out of pocket. Some private insurances will cover things like chiropractic, which is becoming more of a conventional treatment. Acupuncture sometimes, depending on your insurance. Um, please make sure to talk to your doctor about using these interventions so at least they can talk to you about the risks and benefits and at least know about potential interactions, particularly with herbal medications and things like that. Um, I would be cautious of people that are offering you miracle cures, especially things that you'll see on the internet where people describe these miracle cures that doctors don't know anything about. It's a little bit um, unusual to see something like that uh, as, as being actually effective. And find licensed and trained practitioners. If you're going to go to a chiropractor, to an acupuncturist, please find licensed, trained practitioners who do it. Um, and again, these are best approached as complementary and integrative rather than alternatives to the, all the great conventional treatments that you've already heard about today. So thank you all.